Welcome to a meeting of the 100 and Central Regional High School Board of Education. Please be advised that this and all meetings of the board are open to the public and media, consistent with the Open Public Meetings Act and JSA 10 colon 4-6, and that advance notice required therein has been provided. Meeting notice was also posted in the boardroom of the upper school campus, sent to the Courier News, Star Ledger, Express Times, and the Hunter and County Democrat, and sent to the clerks of Delaware Township, East Amwell Township, Flemington Borough, Raritan Township, and Reddington Township. The public will have an opportunity to be heard as shown on the agenda. Can I have a roll call, please, Mrs. Spitzer? Mrs. Bloodfield? Here. Mr. Davidson? Mrs. Duggan? Here. Mr. Fowler? Here. Mrs. Hughes? Here. Mrs. Kellogg? Here. Mrs. O'Donnell? Here. Mrs. Peterson? Here. And Mr. Reimer? Here. Thank you. Can we rise for the flag salute, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Kellogg, would you read our district mission statement tonight, please? Hunted and Central is an innovative educational community dedicated to the intellectual, social, and emotional safety and growth of all students. While fostering curiosity and promoting wellness, we aspire to create powerful learning experiences, establish strong partnerships, and serve as contributing members of society. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please, to convene the meeting for a 30-minute recess for the purpose of touring the facility? So moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Blutfield? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes motion carries. Thank you. All right, we will be back.
We got a motion to reconvene. To reconvene. We do. Oh, we do. We just don't have to do the roll call. Oh, okay. Just do the motion yeah. in the roll call. No, we definitely okay. need to do a motion to reconvene. I misunderstood. Because you did move to adjourn. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we don't need a roll call. We can just. Okay. I was surprised. Oh, okay. I was worried about him. No, thank you. Well, I had to know who's here. Hi, Bruce. Hey. Good to see you, Jerry. We could almost roll call again, so I know who's here. I could just say Mr. D Mr. Davidson arrived. Now you feel warm after walking outside, right? It feels usually this room is freezing. All right. So about how many people are here? We're just waiting on one other board member. Sorry, folks. Okay, can I have a motion, please, to reconvene into public session? So, so moved. moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Oh, uh, we're going to move right into approval of the minutes. Can I have a motion for approval of the August 21, 2023 minutes? So, so moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Nope. Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Bloodfield? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Abstain because I was not here for that meeting. <clears throat> Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes motion carries. Thank you. And can I have a motion and a second, please, for approval of the August 28, 2023 minutes from our board retreat? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Bloodfield? Abstain, I wasn't here. Mr. Davidson? Here, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Du Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Abstain. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes motion carries. Thank you. We have three items of correspondence on the agenda. And with that, we'll move right into Dr. Moore's superintendent report. Thank you, thank you. And thank you all for um, joining us on that walk. That was uh, probably about three quarters of a mile that we did there up and back. So um, you can see how we get our steps in. 
I was kind of in my office for most of the day, so I appreciated that opportunity today to walk around with you. But really good work this summer, um, and kudos to Don Thornton and his crew and uh, everybody involved in just keeping everything on pace, scheduling everything out. On top of that, what we didn't talk about were all the classroom moves, all of the other adjustments to scheduling over the summer, everything else that then also goes into cleaning the facility, 72 acres getting it ship shape for the school year. So uh, enormous, um, great job over the summer. So good job, Don. Uh, and that brought us to opening, and it's been really a wonderful opening this school year. We're real pleased, feeling a lot of hope, feeling a lot of purpose in this school year. Um, really pleased about some of the work around our administrative procedures as they get streamlined through some of the restructuring things that we've worked on with all of you uh, and that uh, Mrs. Spitzer and her office have been taking the lead on, on with uh, Dr. Webb and, and Mrs. Cangelosi Hayden and Mr. Brandt to really just reimagine our processes to be more efficient, more responsive to our staff, students, and parents, and it's, it's going well. Um, we welcome new staff and students you know, right here in this room. All of our freshmen came through here, ninth graders came through here to get their Chromebooks right on that stage. And our new staff were welcomed in this space a few weeks ago as well. Uh, lots of smiles, lots of smiles as we've opened this school year. <coughs> Coach Ransone, Varsity Red Devils are undefeated for 4-0. <laughs> That's something. Um, and just across the board athletically, we're doing, uh, you know, the kids are really doing a good job this season um, and the weather's been thankfully forgiving we didn't get that hurricane that we were keeping our eye on uh, thankness thank goodness um, so I can thank everybody we've thanked Mr. Thorne I've thanked a few folks but uh, the danger when you start to thank people for something as complicated as opening for a school year is that we're gonna miss people um, so I, I don't even want to try to sort of go down the list of everybody who needs thanks from our teachers and counselors our nurses our parents there I am I just did it uh, drivers, everybody. You know, I'm going to miss somebody. I missed somebody, and I just want to thank everyone. But I can thank you. I can thank you all here at the table. Um, and uh, without worry about missing any of you, as you're all here tonight, I have to thank you for joining us through um, the summer, through the, the work that you did in your retreat, uh, and on the agenda tonight. We're seeing your support of innovative work and your, uh, your trust in the staff and the administration here to work with students and families in a really powerful and important way. Um, your trust in the mission that you read every month and how it flows from sound mind and a sound body, our motto, uh, and the work that we're doing on wellness, um, powerful learning and partnership through equity, personalization and service as we look at our strategic frameworks here. So I deeply appreciate and your, your recognition of our need as a community to trust our staff, to trust their passion, to trust their training, to trust their licensure, to trust their skills, to trust their expertise. Uh, it means a lot to them um, as it does uh, to me. And your recognition through your goals that that trust is also founded on the trust that you have within the board. I mean, that's innovative, that's brave. Uh, that's really important what you're doing with your goals and I, I deeply appreciate it. There are some districts, some quite near us, uh, that are moving, um, responding to all of today's challenges by, by well stripping away expertise and trusted expertise in their staff. And I, I just again want to thank you for the work that you're doing to ensure that Central continues to do the innovative work that it does with its students. So um, with that, uh, I want to point out that we don't have a very large agenda tonight. We don't have presentations tonight. We'll have a bunch next month. Next month is a mandated presentation month for us on a couple of uh, things. But I will point out here some organizational items. We have our Hib and Suspension Report here, all uh, zeros at the moment. And uh, although we do have uh, some suspensions to report, uh, in organizational items, we just have your goals and then we roll into your committee reports with all of the motions there. So with that, I'll conclude my report. Thank you, Mrs. Hughes and everybody. Uh, and again, thank you for your support. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Before we move on to organizational items, we'll have our first residence forum for action items on the agenda. If there's anybody who would like to speak for, on action items on the agenda, you'll have five minutes, come up to the podium, state your name and residency. You'll get a um, warning at four minutes with one minute remaining. 
If you have general comments, there will be a second public forum at the end. Okay, doesn't look like anybody is here to speak on action items, so we'll move right into organizational items. Can I have a motion, please, to approve the Board of Education and school goals for the 23-24 school year as recommended by the superintendent? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so in reviewing some of our goals, um, one of the ones that I wanted to discuss was our preparation and time management, the first paragraph, uh, the final sentence in that paragraph suggests that board members should refrain from abstention votes unless the member is procedurally barred. Um, I feel that that's a little aggressive in controlling exactly when we choose to abstain. Um, I'd like to discuss that and see if we should be keeping it in or I know we discussed it during a retreat, possibly removing that from our goals. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Um, I'll just start the discussion with, um, I feel it's important to keep language in about abstention. Um, our goals are aspirational. This is who we want to be. This is an expression of who we want to be and what we want to be as a board. Uh, I feel like we're elected to govern. We're elected to vote. That's what the public expects of us. And in the absence of a legal conflict of interest or uh, absence of a, at a meeting where you didn't know what happened, um, I would like to see the board commit individually to only abstaining in those circumstances. Uh, obviously, we can't force people to vote. <laughs> uh, we can't stop people from abstaining. It's certainly um, every board member's right. Uh, but I believe, and I'd like to hear from the rest, and certainly we'll go with the majority, that um, we owe the public and the constituents to stand up for who we are and, and, and make votes on important issues and difficult issues and challenging issues, and I don't believe that we were elected to abstain on difficult or uncomfortable issues. So I would like to see it stay in. I mean, I, I kind of agree with that sentiment. I was not at retreat, so I didn't hear the discussion. Um, I'd kind of be curious to hear what you think are some of the reasons you might need to abstain for. Well, I, I feel we should, if anything, rely on Robert's rules on when we should abstain. <clears throat> And I don't know that this is necessarily reflecting that guidance. This seems to be um, a little bit more stringent to procedurally barred, right? If, if we said in alignment with Robert's rules of, of conducting ourselves in these meetings, then that would make sense to me because that's sort of what governs us. Um, but I haven't seen definitive documentation that says only through certain cer instances and circumstances should we abstain from voting? Um, there is documentation that says if we're uncomfortable, we can abstain. Can I ask you to point me out, because I couldn't find that. I know that we talked about it in one of the committee meetings, and I think that was just like a general w website that was referring to Robert's Rules. But I went through Robert's Rules today, and I didn't see any list of um, circumstances where you're permitted to abstain. There is language about if there was a legal conflict of interest or in, in absence of being at a meeting. But I didn't see... Um, specific uh, bulleted circumstances where you're permitted to abstain. Yeah, I, I, I don't know of ones where it dictates you have to abstain or should abstain. No, I think you're right, because I think it's up to the individual to make a determination as to whether they're properly voting. R right, yeah. and, and so for us to have, you know, wording of we're procedurally barred from voting is when we should abstain. Um, it, it seems like we're... we're adding a layer of, of construct around when we are allowed to abstain versus when we feel like we want to abstain. So, so again, though, I think what Lisa's saying is these are aspirational, right? So if, as a board, we want to say we should try to be voting, right? Um, I mean, f I would sort of think that, you know, if I, if I missed a meeting or something, Obviously, I abstain on the minutes if I'm um, conflicted ethically, legally, whatever. Um, I will abstain. Otherwise, if it's something that, like, I need more time to think about or I don't understand, I would say that and maybe ask that a vote be tabled. Um, if it's not tabled, I think the public would understand then why I'm abstaining. So... I think to me it's aspirational to to have a vote, vote yes or no, or at least explain or 
question, you know, if you don't, if you don't understand something or you, you, you just, you need more time to at least state that and then everybody understands why you're abstaining. And, and I'd be fine with that. I, I feel that this sentence where it says will refrain unless the member's procedurally barred, that, that seems to be very like dictating that we can only do it. it, it I, so, I agree like, with the concept of- Try to, abs or, um, should. Should. Maybe should. We, we aspire, aspire to, to refrain from abstention right. votes. Right. Or whenever to, possible to, or to explain the abstention that's fine with me but but to have a we will refrain unless it's procedurally but that that seems to be very like stringent i, I agree with that Doctor, just there there's there's been several there have been several this year. Yeah, I don't know if your mic's working. <laughs> um, I don't know that it has been, I mean, certainly with the exception of things that come up last minute, um, you know, it hasn't really been a ongoing issue that has seemed to be a real issue for the board. It's been a lot of abstentions for people who have missed previous board meetings, can't vote on the minutes and things like that. but. As far as like key votes, I, it just doesn't seem like something that has risen to the level that needs to be on the uh, the goals, in my opinion. Can, can I just um, I just want to echo you know kind of what what Lori was saying. I, I think no, am I on? Yours is working either. Is this okay? Um, you know, I, I think that aspirationally we we were elected to take a position, and that and that is the role of of serving on this board. And in doing so, um, I, I think that, that that goal relates to, you know, fostering an environment where we can trust each other, relates to building trust, which is also on there, and knowing that when it's uncomfortable or difficult or we disagree with someone that, um, that we're friends with outside of here, that that's not going to color our vote, that we're going to still vote um, the way we need to and the way we are, we're elected to. Let me just offer one um, one note about your bylaws. Uh, abstaining only appears once in your bylaws. It's in your, your bylaw on a quorum. It's 0163. Uh, and in that bylaw, it just mentions really quickly. Um, let me find it here. Abstain. Uh, when more than a quorum of the board members must abstain from voting on a matter, the board will invoke the doctrine of necessity, which allows you to vote without a quorum. So that's the only mention in, of, of abstaining in your, in your policies. Elsewhere in your policies, it says that anything that's not specifically uh, dictated in the policy falls back on Robert's rules of order. So um, your policies are a little unclear, um, but just know that the goal that you would set, regardless of what it says or doesn't say about abstaining, wouldn't, wouldn't change your policy. If you wanted to change a practice in that way, in a, in a, uh, in a way where everybody would have to do that, it would have, you would have to change your bylaw. Um, if indeed Robert's Rules doesn't specify really specific restrictions around it. Uh, so, and to Ms. Hughes' point, the, it becomes aspirational then, right? <laughs> Then I, I feel like, you know, if, it, if it's an aspirational goal, we should probably just restate it a little bit differently instead of saying, you know, board members will refrain. I mean, that's the part that I'm having a hard time with as well. I, I, and I just want to say that this has been out there <laughs> for a number of days. I'm happy to have this discussion, and maybe we need to do this for a second read, but this was purposely circulated in advance so that we could. So if we want to just... I'm sorry, Bruce, you wanted to add something, but if we want to bring it back on a second read and keep working on the language, if that's what the majority believes is the best way to proceed. Well, I again think it's oh. an aspirational matter. I think and you're cutting out too, Bruce. Modification that we talked about. Okay. The wording modification it was suggested at the beginning when Kane discussed it, and we should, uh, and, uh, and, and now we might modify that will to a different couple of words and that would change the meaning enough that we would be saying we believe everybody should give a reason for 
abstaining, but it doesn't say they must. And I think the should is an aspirational word. We're here representing our voters, the people that elected us, and I believe they have they have the right to try the right to expect us to explain our votes. And so if we if we abstain, I think we should be able to give them a reason. It doesn't have to be specific or final, but at least a reason that not either it's ethical or we don't understand the motion and need to revisit it or we want to bring it up again. But to just blank abstain without that, I think there's a disservice to the public as well as to the board and its members. Does that satisfy you if we just change the wording? Yeah, yeah. As, as, as long as we don't, I, I just was trying to soften it. And again, I, I even think it's something that I don't read in here and explaining why we're abstaining. I think it's a simple. Well, that was take. That was taken out by a board member, and then this sentence was put in by another board member. So I was trying to be, you know, um, inclusive of everybody's to everybody's comments. So the original language about giving a reason was taken, suggested to be taken out. So I accommodated that, and then this sentence w was added in by a board member, and so left it in and circulated it that way. Um, if there's a simple fix to this, such as you know. Uh, board members recognize their individual obligation and responsibility to vote on action items and agree not to refrain or aspire not to refrain or something, if it's that simple. Happy to do that here, you know, at the table so that we don't have to bring this back. I'm, I'm fine with that, and, and I would, if, if we can, um, unless the member, somewhere around alignment to Robert's rules, right? I just, I'm concerned about voting due to absence or ethical necessity. That feels like you're locking into only two things. Again, no problem with transparency to our constituents, no problem with sharing why we're doing something. Um, it's just, I, I like the concept of aspiring in goals rather than goals being something that dictates our actions. How, if how about if we finish the sentence with, unless the member is procedurally barred from voting due to absence or ethical necessity or other reason pursuant to Robert's rules? So Bruce made the original motion, so if he's friendly with it, we can mm -hmm. vote. Okay. Yeah, oh, as amended, yeah. Um, so did we agree that board members will recognize their individual obligation and responsibility to vote on action items and agree not to refrain? Aspire? What? Aspire to refrain. Aspire to refrain? Bruce? Yeah, that's right. Want me to read through it again and you could let me know if you're still okay with moving it uh, as amended? Should I read it? Saying aspire not, to refrain. not not the not. Aspire to refrain. <laughs> aspire to refrain. How about if I just read through it one more time? Or aspire not to yeah. abstain. I'm gonna read I'm gonna read the paragraph. <laughs> Preparation and time management. Board members are expected okay. to be well prepared to discuss and vote on agenda items and ask questions of the appropriate committee chairs, board president and superintendent in advance whenever possible. The superintendent and committee chairs will make best efforts to monitor and manage time well at committee meetings by setting particular time goals for each agenda topic and ensuring committee work remains focused and efficient. Board members recognize their individual obligation and responsibility to vote on action items and we aspire to refrain from abstention unless the member is procedurally barred from voting due to absence or ethical necessity or other reasons pursuant to Robert's rules. How'd I do? Good. Good. Okay. okay. So, good. Bruce, you are moving that as amended? I am moving it as amended. Thank you. And we had a second on that? Was that Lori? Second. Lori, are you okay seconding? Okay, also. Do we have any more discussion or questions on that matter? Okay. Now, the school goals are in the same motion. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think we're ready for a vote. Mrs. Blutfield? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes motion carries. Thank you. Thank you everybody for that discussion. Yeah. I think that was really worthwhile and we're able to wrap it up here at the table. Uh, I will circulate finalized language uh, this, later this week. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our committee reports. Uh, student Life and Program, Mr. Davidson. Uh, yes. We don't have a very large agenda this time, and so 
So that's, that's gratifying. Tuition and transportation, we have five out of district placements. Um, students from North Hunter and Voorhees District, um, we have three of them coming in. Uh, we have a foreign exchange student coming in from Germany. And we have one student for early graduation. And so we only have four action items. Um, oh, wait a second. We also have a, a policy, which we have um, a first reading on. Um, the policy is on public health records. And finally, we have a participation in local education agencies limited instructional certificate of eligibility. Can you say that in one sentence without drawing a breath? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Moore. So we'll make the motion and then Okay, I'll, so yeah. I move <laughs> items one through six under SLP. I have a motion, do I have a second? Any discussion? So number six relates to a pilot program that we're involved in with the state that allows us to uh, take <coughs> um, promising teacher candidates uh, who have not completed all of their requirements with the state of New Jersey. So it gives us a little bit of a leg up through this pilot program on accepting teachers uh, and other certificated staff um, as quickly as we can. And it's, an, it's an opportunity the state's exercising to try and close the gap a little bit in the workforce, and we're looking forward to being both a part of that and a beneficiary of it, but also helping the, the state to learn some lessons about the right way to move forward on this. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Any other questions or comments on SLP? Nope. Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please, Mrs. Spitzer? Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. Bloodfield? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes, motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Fowler, will you give me, be giving O&T? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so we have our normal treasurer's report and secretary report. These are financial reports for July of 2023, reminding that we're always a month and a half behind because of how timing works out. Um, we have our bills list for August of 2023, uh, $6,541.33 that we're moving. We have board transfers uh, for August of 2023, all the account transfers. We are going to do a joint transportation resolution agreement with Somerset County Educational Services Commission. We're setting that up. We are approving this month all of the bus stops. Um, for those of you that took the time, 129 pages, would like to thank our transportation director and his team for putting that together and making sure all of our students are picked up and dropped off in a safe manner. And we have an agreement with Kingwood Township School to transfer students uh, from Kingwood Township to Delaware Township for the amount of $800 for the year. And then we have two policies that we're adjusting. One is um, benefits, duplication of benefits, and another is um, goods and services funded by federal grants. These are things that we're seeing being questioned in the audit that started last year and is still ongoing. Um, so we're firming up our um, policies in that space. And finally, we are starting a professional services agreement for a nurse with Bayada Home Health Care out of Parsippany and the amount of $65 per hour. Believe it or not, that is the only eight topics this month, a very light month, so I can be done in less than a couple minutes. But these are the eight things I'd like to move. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mrs. Bloodfield? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes, motion carries. Thank you. Mrs. Bloodfield, personnel, please. Yes. Um, so we have four retirements this month. Um, they've been with the district between 16 and 29 years, so some <laughs> long-term employees. We have two maintenance workers, John Sima and George Radloff. Hopefully I pronounce those okay. Um, Director of Transportation, Glenn Barry and math teacher Bill Wilson. 
So we will have some pretty big shoes <laughs> to fill this year. Um, like to wish them well in retirement and thank them for their service with the district. We also have four resignations. One of them is Marianne Stokes, if you recall. She accepted the assistant business administrator position effective September 16th, so she's now um, resigning from her old position. We have four contractual appointments, uh, two per diems. We have long-term counselor sub and a substitute teacher. We have our per diem substitute rates for this coming year. The two to note, we have a substitute secretary and substitute custodian rates at $18 an hour, which is an increase from minimum wage. Item number six, we have hourly appointments, HCTV technicians, as well as multilingual learners, teachers. We have uh, for the after school program as well as an adult multilingual learner teacher to help increase family engagement. So that's kind of a nice program that we're starting here. And that's all paid for with Title III grant money. Then uh, number seven, we have our substitute bus drivers. Eight, we have, we're approving a staff member who did some summer curriculum writing work. Then we have our AM, PM supervision, PM security, uh, on to 11 special services, summer child study teamwork, which uh, was a summer, uh, a staff member who attended a summer IEP meeting. Then we have in number 12, a new staff induction buddy stipend for our new business teacher. We have in number 13, a substitute caller stipend. And this is something new that we're starting and it's to have someone make some calls for substitutes in the evening to help lessen the burden in the early morning. And so we need money to pay for someone to do that uh, as extra hours. Then number 14, our professional development. You'll see some coaches listed. We do not have the October School Boards Association conference listed and that will be on next month's agenda when the costs are finalized. Item 15, we have our Schedule C unpaid advisors, which includes a community volunteer for band. We have 16 as our Schedule C paid advisor for the German American Exchange Program. 17, we have two assistant coaches listed. 18 is a <coughs> FMLA for a paraprofessional. And finally, an amendment in number 19 that was on last month's agenda. We had the correct salary. We just have to revise the step that was uh, incorrect last month. In addition to the agenda items, a couple other things that we discussed at the meeting. Um, we, con we talked about the continued administrative restructuring that's been going on. And Dr. Moore also shared with us some data on administrative cost per pupil, which is something we'll continue to be looking at. Um, but I will just say that uh, initially it shows that we do compare very favorably to other districts, so that's all good. And with that, I will move personnel items one through 19. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion about personnel? Just wanna share that we, we do actually, we celebrate retirements here. I mean, we, mm -hmm. around the table, we regard, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe these folks are leaving. In this particular group, we have um, four individuals who really represent some of the heart and soul here who've put a lot into this place. You know, Glenn Berry, who Mr. Fowler was talking earlier about our transportation, you know, 6,000 students, or more than 6,000 students transported to and from every day. Um, Glenn has made that look effortless. You know, George and John are stalwarts in Mr. Thornton's uh, team, and then Bill Wilson there in our math department, uh, very popular teacher amongst our kids. So this is, this is quite a powerful group. We wish them well, but um, sad about what they're gonna take with them. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Bruce. Um, thank you. Glenn Barry is a particularly valuable employee in that he has risen to transportation manager and managed the complex operations of the transportation department for many years. 
Um, and I'm just concerned that we have sufficient time to replace him with somebody who's trained and gotten his wisdom you know, from his head to theirs, and we document as much of it because Glenn Barry has been a, a invaluable asset to the district, um, and he guides not only the transportation department day to day, but he's a key member of the transportation the joint transportation committee. And I just um, want to note his value to us. He's done a wonderful job and hope that we can transfer his knowledge as seamlessly as possible. Thank you, Bruce. Anyone else? Can I have a roll call vote, please, on personnel? Mrs. Blutfield? Yes. Mrs. Kellogg? Yes. Mr. Reimer? Yes. Mrs. Mr. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mrs. Duggan? Yes. And Mrs. Hughes? Yes. All yes, motion carries. Thank you. Mrs. O'Donnell, do we have an update on racism, equity, diversity? Yes. Um, we have been um, working to get everyone together for a meeting to take some important next steps as the care committee. Um, which developed policy 8100 with lots of stakeholders and students and um, really good community input. Um, we're looking to determine the best ways to grow the committee's roster to include students um, and, and to really empower their leadership, which al aligns with our district goals. And um, thank you to uh, Dr. Moore for all of the data and um, statistics and just all the information that you presented to us that you captured so that we can look at that, refine it, and then come to the meeting, the care committee meeting, um, prepared to set some goals to address gaps in achievement and access, um, disparities in discipline. Um, so those are the next steps we're looking to take. And um, Dr. Moore, if you wanna add anything to that, I'm happy to, to yeah. turn it over. So thank you. Yeah, we're meeting on the 20th this week. So just uh, a couple of days that group will meet. Um, includes uh, staff from all different corners of, of the district. And then again, one of the items on our agenda is talking about how to expand that to students, parents, and other stakeholders. And in particular, that policy calls for student leadership, as Noel mentions. Um, but the data snapshot, which you've all seen before as well, uh, is uh, the big item of conversation on the 20th and, and that group will be looking at setting some goals uh, in that data to continue to move the policy 81 effort, 8100 efforts forward. Um, so we're looking forward to report on that to you all uh, in the coming months as we get through that first cycle of, of goal setting and, and um, gap closing. So looking forward to that on the 20th. Thank you, Dr. Moore and Mrs. O'Donnell. Anyone have any questions or comments for the Red Committee? Then Mrs. Kellogg, do you have an update on Communications Committee? Um, so we talked through the schedule for developing a communications policy. Um, and we're, we're at the point in the year where we either need to be aggressive and try to get the first and second reading done before the end of December, or we need to um, push to the first and second meeting of next year. So at this point, we are going to try to be aggressive. We're going to try to have a, a policy development committee pulled together by October 1st um, with the intention of bringing the first read of draft policy 9120 to the board in November. Uh, concurrent with that, Mrs. Tucker will be doing a presentation on the data that she's brought to the committee, as well as her discussions on social media um, and best practices with some of the administration. So um, I think that, oh, and, and then after we discussed that timeline, Mrs. Tucker did give us an update on the social media guideline meetings that she's been having and developing with um, the advisors for uh, both academic and athletic organizations. Thank Dr. You. Moore, anything you wanted to add? I just, I wanna repeat my thanks from earlier when I gave my report, just the communications policy along with policy 8100, these are examples of the kind of policy writing that you're doing uh, as a board that includes the folks who are gonna be impacted by those policies. You know, it's in the open, good discussions, uh, and I think it's, it's one, of, one of the more innovative things that you do as a board is the way in which you approach policy to ensure that it reflects not only the best of what's going on, 
um, but also, again, trust in uh, the professionals who implement that policy and, and aspirations to align to our strategic goals. So I appreciate that. Looking forward to that policy project. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Anyone else have questions or comments about communications? I just wanted to say something. So, you know, a student's life coming to high school could be very overwhelming. And sometimes for parents, it can be overwhelming as well, right? And I just wanted to call out Nancy Tucker and say thank you and Mr. Brandt for all the communications that have come out this year as a parent for a child in the high school. Really good information, a lot of information, but um, I remember taking note a couple of weeks back, I was going to send you a note and just say, you know, really well done with keeping parents up to date on, on what's going on. So thank you. Absolutely. Good point, Ms. Duggan. Okay, so that concludes our committee reports. Um, any additional business? Do we have any committee member or liaison reports? Yes? yes. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about Joint Transportation Committee. Um, it's one of those fun committees that you don't see too much about up here, um, but it affects everybody. All of our students are ultimately trafficked through and, and managed by the efforts of that Joint Transportation Committee between us and members of Flemington Raritan. Um, as, as Dr. Moore put it probably about a year ago, um, the bylaws for that committee uh, were established in 95, 96, and I think it's safe to say on much of a handshake and less of bylaws. And over the years, the functioning of that committee has listed and had some challenges in being efficient and being smooth. Um, I'll even share that uh, as recent as the last couple of months, we've struggled to even meet as a, as a group and get to those meetings collectively as a group to have these conversations. Um, over the last two months, we've really put our heads down and focused on re-synergizing, re getting back into alignment with each other across the central members and the Flum Rarit members. And uh, last week, a week and a half ago, we met in the dark during our power outage on a Wednesday and finalized our thoughts on uh, how we feel the bylaws need to be amended. And uh, we received confirmation that our attorney for JTC is going to be at the October 11th meeting. So we look forward to finally bringing forward some more robust bylaws to function under um, and I think it's very timely with the retirement that was announced tonight that we bring some structure with that committee because we have two large challenges ahead of us this year um, negotiations with the drivers and finding a replacement for, for Mr. Barry so I'm glad that we were able to come together as a group um, Flemington Raritan also showed up with their best interest and in, in heart and um, hopefully we're, we're getting that energy again that we need to work as one unit Thank you, Mr. Fowler. And I want to give some kudos and thanks also to you, Mr. Fowler, as chair of the JTC, Ms. Duggan and uh, Mr. Davidson as well, who are the central uh, contingents of the JTC. So a lot of really good hard work has been done the last few months. So thank you, along with Mrs. Spitzer, of course, and Dr. Moore and Mr. Barry. Any additional board business? Do we have any other liaison reports from this month? No. Okay. Any other general additional board business before we move into the second residence forum? Okay, so we will now move into the second residence forum. This is for general comments of the public. Um, as I stated earlier, if you'd like to speak, please come up to the podium. Uh, there should be a piece of paper up there. Write your name down and your residency. Please also state it for the record. You will have five minutes to speak. Uh, you will get a notification at four minutes when you have one minute remaining. Good evening. Um, my name is Suzanne Bocage. I'm a resident of Raritan Township and um, mother of three and grandmother of 10. I appreciate this opportunity to address the board this evening. My hope is that every student here at Hunter and Central Raritan High School excels academically this year in a kind, respectful atmosphere where they feel valued. But there is a mental health crisis going on in America, and our children are part of it. 
the Enhancing School Mental Health Services Project has been introduced. I'm glad to see that the accompanying comprehensive school-based mental health resources guide <laughs> incorporates the importance of parents. It states that school professionals need to acknowledge parents' values and priorities and treat them as equal partners by recognizing their role as experts on their children. Regarding developmental risks and resilience, families are an essential partners in ensuring student safety. Historically, faith and religion has been part of cultural consideration. The guide recognizes only past elements of race and ethnicity. Convic convictions of faith and religion are an important component and need to be incorporated when applicable to the student. The guide expands culture to include other elements, but the convictions of faith and religion are still left out. Also noted in the guide is the incomplete brain development of adolescents with po the possible presentation of high impulsivity, antisocial behavior, aggressiveness, lack of self-control, and substance, substance abuse. These make mental health of our youth very difficult with the state of their brain development. The UCLA Williams Institute reports that the number of trans youth has doubled from 2017 to 2022. The number of detransitioners is growing there are numerous reports of children who were not adequately counseled about their mental health and gender dysphoria. Their stories are readily available on the internet. Reuters itself has 50,000 subscribers to the site. The World Professional Organization for Transgender Health member doctors, Erica Anderson and Marcy Bowers, who are both transgender women, Note that counseling is often deficient. Dr. Anderson stated that dozens of families told her that it's not unusual for a child to spend only 20 minutes with a doctor before being offered hormones. She stated last year that peer pressure is behind the rise in LGBTQ plus teens, and she claimed that clinics were not doing enough to ensure that those who wanted transitions were actually committed to the process. Dr. Kinnan McKinnon, a 37-year-old transgender man and assistant professor of social work at York University, focuses on sex and gender minority health. His team talked to 40 detransitioners some reported avoided te avoiding telling their doctors about detransitioning out of embarrassment, shame, or a belief that their doctors wouldn't be able to help them. Most often, they said that the transitioning did not address their dysphoria and mental health needs. His research on TikTok and online forums opened his eyes to the abuse that detransitioners can experience. It's tragic when, in addition to the psychological suffering endured, a child has been medically and or surgically transitioned only years later to regret the changes to their bodies that are lifelong. I have addressed these important findings out of my concern for our children and to bring awareness. My hope is that what I have addressed tonight benefits the Hunter and Central Regional High School students, faculty, and the, their families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Heather Mazio. I'm a resident of Flemington and a parent and employee here at Central. I've read some things online recently that criticize brave people who have been speaking up for our LGBTQ kids at these meetings, saying they don't have kids in the school and so don't speak for the quote, average Central parent. 
This is ridiculous because the people they seem to be criticizing the most are members of the LGBTQ plus community who themselves have had a difficult time in high school and just want the kids today to have a better experience. It's exceptionally brave of them to share things so deeply personal and painful and to put themselves on the front line to help our kids. But if some people are unwilling to learn from the wisdom of their experience, if they need to hear from average parents, that's fine, that's short-sighted, but I'll volunteer as tribute. I'll, I'm about as average as they come. Here's my CV. I've been a mom for 18 years. When I decided to stay home, I threw myself into it. I never missed a Halloween parade. I volunteered every picture day, bake sale, walkathon, field day, and teacher appreciation week. My kids played soccer, went to story time at the library, did summer camp, and did scouts for 10 years, during which time I worked at dozens of cookie booths and was a troop leader for seven years. I took first aid and CPR classes and got certified so I could lead overnight scout troops, which I organized for our service unit team. My husband and I both attended Catholic school, kindergarten through college. We raised our children in the church, attending mass nearly every Sunday, and upon choosing to send them to public school, registered them in CCD classes every year. At work here in the cafeteria, I try and look out for and take care of all the students that come through my line. I wear an ally pin so kids know that they are, that I'm a safe person for them. I didn't honestly think anyone would even notice that I did so because I was a teen in the 90s and I'm well familiar with Sandler and Farley's Ode to Cafeteria staff and so I thought no one would even notice me but I can't tell you how many comments I've received about this little pin. Some loudly and enthusiastically complimenting it and others <clears throat> quietly leaning in to whisper thank you. Now that my qualifications for averageness are established, first let me thank the board members who do support our LGBTQ plus kids. I can only imagine how exhausting and difficult it must be to stand strong in the face of such hostile opposition, but please know that it means the world to parents such as myself. From the first second I knew they existed, everything I've done has been for my kids. They're the best people I know. So you can imagine how infuriating it is to hear some people at these meetings slandering them and their friends. Grown adults who come here and verbally assault our children right to their faces. And for people to attribute their bigotry to their religion is particularly galling. I was raised Roman Catholic, but in my 17 years of Catholic school, what I remember learning are things like love thy neighbor as thyself and judge not lest thee be judged. The thing is, religion is a choice. You can choose to participate or not participate. You can choose which major religion you believe in and within that which denomination most aligns with your beliefs. You can convert to other religions due to a change in beliefs or for marriage. And you can be raised in the church and as an adult choose to step away. But gender identity and sexual orientation are not a choice. They're an intrinsic part of who a person is and cannot be changed any more than their skin color, eye color, or ethnic heritage. A person cannot be groomed into being queer any more than they can be converted from it. To deny someone rights and representation based on their gender identity and sexual orientation is as wrong as to do so based on those other intrinsic characteristics. The bottom line is, and has been mentioned here before, that this is a public school, which means all students, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, or sexual orientation, deserve to be represented and have their needs met. That's the bottom line. And I thank you to those of you who support and protect that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mazier. Good evening, Sandra DeVore, Raritan Township. A few months ago, I gave information to the board about inappropriate comments made by board member Noelle O'Donnell. The comments were posting she made on social media during the last Board of Ed election, which insulted people she called extremists. She said were full of hate and were paper terrorists. People she disagreed with were simply loud in their lies and hatred. At the time, the board was issuing an action to file an ethics complaint against another board member, Mrs. Peterson. The board allowed Ms. O'Donnell to apologize, but took action against Mrs. Peterson. I bring this up because we are in another 
election cycle for the Board of Ed. Once again, groups are using divisive language to insult a large group of students, parents, and community members. One such group is New Jersey Public Education Coalition. NJPEC has similar language on their website that Ms. O'Donnell apologized for. Some examples are NJPEC's goal to protect our public schools and communities from right-wing extremism. The radical right has a collective goal of dismantling public education. They are attacking our children's education with hate, intolerance, and racial bias. NJPEC is providing the resources and support necessary for common sense school board candidates to combat the toxic environment created by right wing extremist organizations. Surely, if the board allowed Ms. O'Donnell to apologize in lieu of taking action against her, action they took against Mrs. Peterson, then Ms. O'Donnell will no longer participate in such behavior. But the funny thing is, Ms. O'Donnell is on the advisory committee of NJPEC. Her current actions are in complete disregard of the leniency you gave her, but did not afford Mrs. Peterson. In a recently pu made public letter, a sitting board member quit NJPEC and in part wrote, as a current school board member, I feel that the NJPEC has put myself and other board members in a path for potential ethics charges. She then lists the part of the ethics code that are in violation. I urge you to take firmer action this time and file an ethics complaint against Ms. O'Donnell. I also urge Ms. O'Donnell to follow the lead of the other board member and resign from NJPEC. Lastly, another group has taken an active role in supporting Board of Ed candidates by, provid by providing marketing support. This group is Action Together New Jersey. They are branding candidates across the state that align with their beliefs. The common brand is a yellow background with a black apple. Board of Ed candidates that have this branding are directly aligned with this 5013C organization. Are candidates that partner with them surrendering their independent judgment to special interest or partisan political groups? I noticed that one Board of Ed candidate for Central, Pam Cassidy, has this branding on her website. Sandra Gong and three other K through eight candidates recently removed the Black Apple from their site. Did they realize aligning with the special interest group is not appropriate? Mrs. Gong covering the Black Apple on her website with a blue box does not mean that she is disassociated. We are done with this nonsense and we want people on the board who represent the voice of parents who do not want schools to keep secrets from parents. So please vote for Maria Prendimano, Claudia Gray, and Lisa Santangelo. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Victor Lamantia. I am a gay male, and I'm representing a nonprofit organization called Gays Against Groomers. Mr. Lamantia, can you please state your town of residency, please? Surely, uh, Lindhurst, New Jersey, in Thank Bergen you. County. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, back in June, when the uh, drag section of the New York City Pride Parade chanted, we're coming for your children, I thought, oh, they can't really mean that. They're just trying to get a rise out of parents. But with recent phenomena such as drag queen story hour and sexualizing school curricula, clearly coming for your children is becoming a reality. We're witnessing biological boys identifying as girls in girls' bathrooms and in sex ed classes designed for girls. Biological categories of male, female are being erased from curricula. Though I don't see how you can teach a sex ed class without mentioning biological sex. This needs to stop. Girls are a protected class entitled to their own safe spaces. Replacing male, female, he, she, etc. with gender identity labels goes against science and common sense. Welcome to the trans agenda in which a small minority is trying to dictate to the rest of us what we can and cannot say castrate and mutilate minors behind parents' backs, and remove children from parents who don't affirm a child's gender identity. 
If there is ever a concern that informing parents about a child in crisis would endanger a child, I defer to the sensible policies of Middletown, Marlboro, and Manalapan, which is to always inform the parents about their children's welfare, except if there is evidence that doing so will harm a child. Having a secret invitation-only drag show during school hours without parental knowledge fosters distrust and suspicion. If the Pulse Club is claiming that nothing inappropriate happened during the show and everything was done within school code, then why not invite parents and let them see for themselves? I think uh, everyone here should pay close attention to who you are voting for and whether they support parental notification. A um, National Library of Medicine article says 40% uh, of transgender individuals have attempted suicide with suicidality highest among transgender youth. I don't doubt that is true. But is medicalizing and butchering minors going to stop transgender individuals from committing suicide? Sounds like a formula for suicide. So-called gender-affirming care that includes life-altering surgeries is no guarantee that adolescents will not attempt suicide. Also, I highly recommend that everyone read the lead article in the summer 2023 edition of Gays Against Groomers Times, entitled The Transgender Bill of Rights, Gay Erasure, and the End of Childhood Innocence. If you would like a copy, come see me. Lastly, get off TikTok and know your facts. These aren't your kids, and we will not stop until you leave our kids alone. Thank you. So it's 8.12, we've got time for two more speakers, and then the 30 minutes will be up. Very good. Uh, good evening. Uh, Jim Vargas, Monmouth Beach, longtime resident of uh, Raritan Township. Um, I attended and testified at the state board hearings, I think it was on the 6th, and that was right after the uh, approval to the changes in equity uh, agreements were, cha were, were changed, which drove a lot of people to be unhappy about it. You actually received a letter from the Association of American uh, Doctors and Surgeons, which I forward to you, uh, Madam President, that really fought against that. But I think that's the last of things that happened over the last couple of years that really kind of people would call it the nail in the coffin type of thing. When I looked at it, I find that there, this board has an has a, a opportunity to clean up the bad things that happened the last couple of years. And Ms. Hughes, it leans on you. I, this is an opportunity that you're not going to be serving the board anymore. It gives you an unfettered view, and you can be a person that brings us all together again. So I have 10 recommendations that you approach. And there are no property order and uh, some are small, some are big. Number one, an apology to Mr. Paul Tanko. Whatever the issues were that, that agreed between his actions and the administration, they did not encourage it, insulting his character and saying that he endangered students. He did not. Mr. Tanko is a military veteran. He is a long-term retired police officer. He serves the community. His, his character was insulted. He is owed an apology by both the superintendent and the board. Along those lines, too, secondly, we have never received a comprehensive review of the incidents that happened in May of last year in which Nicole Pacano was attacked. We were told different things. We received a PowerPoint, which nobody bought into. Uh, a couple months ago, a, another woman got up and complained that we haven't heard anything and her son was affected by it and nothing's been done. We need a full report of what happened and what's, what the outcomes are there. I understand you have legal things going on, but it doesn't matter. This, this community is really owed. Uh, a full accounting of that information. Number three, and it's a little hard, um, given the fact that the, both Nicole and uh, Paul were Christians, Catholics at a St. Magdalene's parish over here, the board has to take a cursory look were there any religious prejudice things involved in those actions. And they need to take a look at it because it's only a fair thing to do. Number four, the law states the school must accept the gender pronouns of a person. But, um, it, does, it says they, they don't have to know the parent. 
We have a fight about this going on now, right? Some schools have fought against it, openly rebelled against it. Some people have come up and, and done nothing, kept their heads low. This board ha or this school is taking no action against it. We need a, 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 a rule from you and a policy from you that you will involve parents in all decisions that when it comes to gender identity. Now, if you have issues, again, that, that are child safety, you can refer to the state agencies that can handle that. Number five. All lesson plans that would deal with diversity, inclusion, and equity should be open to the public, not only the parents, but also to the public in general. People have a right to know what their children are being teaching. And they're going to be, in this course of state, there are 116,000 teachers that are going to be addressing this. So it has to be open to the public. Number six, the new, uh, the new education policies have come up and been in. So we know, we heard a lot of things about those things, that they are far beyond what they should be. Number one, they not only address acts, they address uh, character and what is, what is right and wrong. That is the province of religion or faith or character. It has nothing to do with the school. Uh, it also says things that are not in line with what people want and want to believe. So what we need either is to you to walk away from it and shut it down totally or at least come back and have an opt-in policy, not an opt-out policy, where parents have to positively opt in like other school boards had done. Number seven, last year we mentioned Ms. O'Donnell had a flyer that really said very objectionable, objectionable things to people like me. But that's free speech. She has a right to say it. But I would like to know if the board feels the same way. Following that up, uh, you ought to cease all the activities against Mrs. Peterson. Mrs. Peterson, it was free speech. She said the same thing. And if you don't uh, satisfy Mrs. Peterson, then you ought to see the same charges against Ms. O'Donnell's. Number nine, teachers and counselors do have an important role in supporting students beyond delivering the curriculum, but it's limited. This board has put a policy that uh, teachers are prohibited from taking students to medical behavior, whether they get to contraceptives or whether they go for abortions or they take hormone data. They should be prohibited from doing that. And if not, the ground should be termination. And number 10, we really need to view the overall uh, performance review of the superintendent. Some of the things that came out during, during uh, conversations have been so biased and so one way leaned, it needs to be reviewed and we need a performance back to you. We, we would put in a, in a corporation called a PIP, a performance impro uh, improvement plan. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. Hi, my name is Sandra Gong from Raritan Township, taxpayer, parent. Um, I do want to, I know I'm supposed to address the board, but I do want to address uh, my namesake, Sandra DeVore, who said something about me. Ms. Gong, um, I would ask that you just direct your comments to the board, please. Yes, uh, Madam President. So I am a lot of things, but I'm also a Luddite. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, putting things on or off of my website, I don't have a clue. So if there's a blue box over a black apple somewhere on my website, I don't know how it got there, but as I said, I'm a Luddite. You know, I grew up uh, sort of lower, lower um, income. There were four kids. Um, my mother, father came to this country from another country. My father had an addiction. And my wish for my kids was that I could always give them more. I think that's what a lot of parents believe. I want to make, um, I want to have a good career so I can give my kids more. So people say, I want my children to have the things I never had. Should we also say, I want my child to be the person I never was? How would you like to be remembered? as someone who was full of hate or full of kindness, or as someone who was well-respected, as a taker or a giver. I know how I want my children to be remembered, but how do I know how they might remember me? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gong. So we are 30 minutes is just about up to conclude public session, which is what I said when the last speaker spoke. How many more folks intend to speak? 
I think just myself and this one other lady here. Okay. How does the board feel about allowing two additional speakers? It shouldn't be too long. Probably about a half. Uh, I don't know. You would know yeah, best. Half hour. Half hour. Okay. So, okay. Two more speakers tonight after this um, young lady here in the light green sweat sweater speaks. We'll close down public session. My name is Valerie from Flemington. Valerie, could we have your last name, please? Rosen. Thank you. I'm a mental health professional, and I wanted to address the state-induced psychosocial epidemic we call gender affirmation and inclusion. I believe in science, as many in your seats have also asserted, so why don't we look at this issue from that perspective? Because science says there are two sexes, male and female, boy and girl. And that sex is established at conception. It can be observed before a child is even born. These things are unchangeable no matter how many hormones one takes or surgeries one has. At the most fundamental level, a male will always be male and a female will always be female. Females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y chromosome. When a person dies and his or her DNA is, in, is examined, he will still be he and she will still be she, even if he lived his whole life believing he was a she and she lived her whole life believing she was a he. Science also says that you need fem female reproductive organs to bear a child, and men will never have female reproductive organs. If men were bent to bear children, they would have been born with the appropriate equipment rem rendering them female. Fortunately, men have reproductive organs that contribute to conception of a child. You need both male and female in order for the human race to live on. As an ideology, transgenderism is an existential threat to the survival of the human race, and science agrees with this. This is the way it has worked since the beginning of time. Nothing has changed scientifically, but what has happened is a small group of activist elitists have suddenly decided to play God by rewriting history and science to suit their own agenda, a blitzkrieg of threats, mind manipulation, and an all-out assault on the natural rights of humanity. In fact, we have some of these activists sitting on this board right now. Why is this board promoting such anti-scientific agenda? It's not common sense. What would make sense for a child who is questioning his or her identity? We need to figure out why the child is experiencing this distress in the first place and treat that problem accordingly. The solution is not just to agree with the child who claims to be born in the wrong body. By agreeing, you're telling the child that there's something fundamentally defective about him or her, so she or he needs to be fixed. All while asserting others should just accept the child for who the child is. Please make this make sense. As adults, we know that children have colorful imaginations. We know they grow and change as they age. Science informs us that human brain does not reach developmental maturity until age 25. So why are we arguing that it is a good idea for kids to decide whether they want a penis or a vagina? Kids are vulnerable and impressionable. They are heavily influenced by their peers and outside culture at large, especially social media. When we stand in agreement with this gender affirmative ideology, we are saying that a child can do and be whatever she or he wants at any given time. If your child decided that he or she no longer identifies as an able-bodied person, but instead identifies as a physically handicapped person, would you then take your child to have both of his or her legs amputated so they, that person could live an affirmed life? This board is on a campaign of deranged and sadistic Tavistock Institute-style social engineering that is being waged against the populace with the intention of complete and total demoralization of the individual and destruction of the traditional family unit so that we will not be able to protect and support each other. A house divided against itself will not stand, and they know this. More power to the overlords means less power for you as the slaves are destined to live only to serve their bureaucrat masters, depressed, anxious, hating themselves and others, fully dependent on pharmaceutical drugs and the nanny state for the rest of their lives. The enforcement of this cult ritual on our kids and the coercion and intimidation of our parents who are standing in the gap for them is in direct violation of Title 18, United States Code 241 and 242, conspiracy against rights and deprivation of rights under the color of law. This, is, this means that any attempt by any officer to infringe on the rights of parents to protect their kids, speak on their behalf, exercise their First Amendment right to freedom of speech and religious practice, as well as redress of grievances under the 2019 New Jersey revised statute subsection 10 5 through 12 is repugnant to the Constitution these codes are in place to protect your constituents from violation of their constitutional rights by any officers or public servants including yourselves and violations of these codes carry the penalty of fines and or imprisonment if found guilty the state of New Jersey and the New Jersey Board of Education operate as subsidiaries as the of the federal government a US government agency the president governor corporation, their president, corporate 
officers, agents, representatives, business partners, general managers, attorneys, lawyers, you, et cetera, have no lawful right or authority to make law or circumvent the law in the creation of policy that violates the law. In order to have any force in law, corporate policy should not violate the law, but work hand in hand with the law and your procedure to enforce any mandate proves otherwise your mandate fails to contain elements or substantiation in law and therefore is invalid and cannot be enforced tyrannically or under color of law outside of the law as it is otherwise as it otherwise violates a human being's unalienable rights. Acceptance, as we call it, is diametrically opposed to telling the child that she will feel better and all of her distress will magically disappear if a doctor just performs a double mastectomy on her. Thank Acceptance you, Mrs. Rosen, is your time saying is up. that Thank she you. was born just the way she was supposed to be. The good Lord doesn't make mistakes. Let's help these kids find healing and empowerment in who they are just as they were. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Your time is up. Good evening. My name is Linda Rad. I'm from Reddington Township. Uh, last Monday, Hanover School District repealed transgender policy 5756, recognizing that parents have the fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their children as it relates to education, welfare, health, discipline, etc. Fundamental Fundamental indicates the highest level of protection. The New Jersey Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court have long-standing case law supporting these rights. There are hundreds of cases being litigated right now, and parents are winning. The court has recognized that when a school decides to keep a life-altering decision of a minor from their parents or guardian, they are assuming an unlawful custodial role. In San Francisco, the court awarded the parents monetary damages for secretly transitioning their daughter. The daughter shared with the judge that she never really thought she was a boy, but the school did not want to hear that, and she didn't know how to get out of the situation. James Michael, New Jersey Chief Deputy Attorney General, stated last week that the transgender policy is not law or state mandate, meaning this is not a policy that every district is mandated to have. This policy was an attempt to remove par parent par parental authority and hand it over to the state. In the recent Monmouth poll, the majority of parents support parental notification with 81% of parents in favor of parental notification. Why would schools move in the opposite direction of this? Are all 81% of these parents haters because they want to be informed of what their own children who are minors are doing? In is Mr. Estrada also a hater when he was explaining during this year's freshman orientation how kids' frontal cortex is not fully developed? Therefore, it is very important for parents to be involved in the decision-making process with their kids because kids sometimes make the wrong decision. We have asked the board before many times, and we are asking again to listen to the majority of parents and repeal policy 5756. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rudd. That we will conclude our second public session. We'll move. Oops, sorry. We're going to conclude our second public session and move into executive session to discuss uh, personnel matters for about 30 minutes with no action being taken upon return. Thank you. Can I have a motion to convene into executive session, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.